Hello and welcome to the North Seattle College Art Gallery's Virtual Visiting Artist Lecture Series. I'm Amanda Knowles, the coordinator of the NSC Art Gallery, and I teach printmaking and drawing in the art department at North Seattle College. I'm pleased to work with Desiree Beadle, who's my assistant in the gallery. Today is the final visiting artist lecture for the 22-23 school year, and we are thrilled to have Seattle-based artist Megan Elizabeth Trainer with us. I want to tell you early on that we have live transcript available for those who want it. It can be turned on by clicking the show subtitle button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. For those who don't want it or find it distracting, turn it off by clicking hide subtitle. Use it if you wish, hide it if you wish, but we want to be sure we have it for those who need it. First, some acknowledgments and I will share my screen. First, the land acknowledgment. North Seattle College acknowledges that we occupy the lands of the Coast Salish peoples, the descendants of the first peoples of this region, a people whose cultures endure and are valued. Without this land and these cultures, we would not have access to this gathering dialogue and learning space. We take this moment to honor and thank the original caretakers of this land, their ancestors and their descendants who are still here. We encourage participants here today to consider our responsibilities as we stand in solidarity with the sovereignty cultural heritage and lives of native indigenous and first nations peoples. And then a labor acknowledgement. We also pause to recognize and acknowledge the labor that created the United States and from which we all benefit. We remember that our nation is built on the labor of enslaved people who were forcibly brought to the United States from the African continent. And we recognize the continued contribution of their survivors. We acknowledge immigrant labor and recognize that voluntary force and prison labor co contribute to the building and ongoing maintenance of our nation. We acknowledge all unpaid caregiving labor. Additionally, we acknowledge the critical importance of the work towards racial equity that continues across this country in response to the racial injustice and generations of structural racism against BIPOC communities. And then the third slide, um, this next slide shows what we are doing as we continue to work to go from acknowledgement to deed. We know that it's not enough to just acknowledge the land and labor and have to be sure that we are taking action. We show you here what actions North Seattle College and the North Seattle College Art Department are taking to support BIPOC individuals and institutions and to be held accountable. We recommend Real Rent Duwamish and we'll put that link in the chat for you to explore. Thank you. Uh, 22-23 NSC juried student show is currently up in the NSC art gallery this Wednesday, June 7th from 4 to 5.30 live in the art gallery. We will hold an award ceremony for this show. At this event, there will be awards as well as five to six selected artists talking about their work. Campus parking enforcement is back. So if you come to campus, please visit the parking kiosks on campus and call the art gallery for the code that gives you access to two hour parking. There is information on the plan your visit tab on the NSC Art Gallery website. The last day of the student show is next Thursday, June 15th. I have no idea how it went so quickly. The gallery is open uh, Monday through Thursday, 11 to 5 p.m. and Fridays, 11 to 2 p.m. But just this Friday, next Friday, students will be picking up their artwork. Please come see the show and support these fabulous students. Uh, we are continuing to make plans for our next year's exhibitions and visiting artists lectures. So please keep checking in with the gallery on Facebook and Instagram and, and our website to find out uh, what is going on in the gallery and who will be talking and when, or what we will be showing and when. We also urge you to visit our website for links to recordings of nearly all of the talks to date. We will post our links in the chat. You can sign up for the emails by contacting contacting us at nscartgallery at seattlecolleges.edu. I want to remind you that the NSC Art Gallery is nothing without the support from the college, student leadership, and from you all. Thank you for the help that you've given to the gallery by coming to these events and sharing them with people that you know who might enjoy them. Thank you. And on to the real reason that we are here. Uh, Megan Elizabeth Trainer is a Seattle-based artist, writer, and lecturer and performer. Her work has been exhibited nationally and internationally from Seattle and New York to Berlin, Copenhagen and Barcelona. Her work was included in Safety, a five person show based around safety, security, 
Technology and Refuge last September at Fresh, Fresh Mochi in Beacon Hill here in Seattle. Her solo exhibition, Let Us Not Confuse Zero with the Stillness of Electrons was hung at the Center on Contemporary Art or COCA in the summer of 2021. She has been featured in Good Witch, Bad Witch at Museum of Museums, the Fry Art Museum's interview view series, Virtual Visits, hosted by Nagara A. Kadumo, and as a guest on Critical Bound podcast series, Art, AI, and Technology. She completed her master's at Tisch School of the Arts at New York University, and has been an artist in residence at the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, uh, the Digital Performance Institute, and the Janie and James Washington Foundation. She has lots of things going on right now. Uh, Frontier Home in Beacon Hill is putting on Sagnan Inc. and Logic. New works by Megan Elizabeth Trainer and Sarah Lipstick opening on June 23rd. Um, her electricity masks will be part of the uh, Bainbridge Island Museum of Art Spotlight uh, Juried Artists Art Show opening um, in on June 30th and up through October 2023. Trainish practice uh, centers her scholarship in the through lines between computer science, technology, and esoterica. She frames this through storytelling around bogs, hedge witchery, and digital witchcraft, and the use and histories of electronics and electricity. The range of her storytelling includes everything from essays on speculative histories and logic gates to spoken word pieces and cunningly worded memes and NFTs. Megan currently holds the position of curator of the M. Rosetta Hunter Art Gallery at uh, <laughs> Seattle Central College. This is new. Um, <laughs> if, uh, although an interim for many years. <laughs> Um, if you have not followed what Megan is doing at that gallery, you should, as it's strongly political and engaged in community. Thank you. Welcome, <laughs> Megan. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. And now I'm going to share my screen. Okay, now we're cooking with gas. Hello, everyone. So happy to be here. My name is Megan. And I think the first thing to start with is important to know, I grew up down the street. I'm from here. I'm a proud graduate of Rainier Beach High School, go Vikings. Um, and I got my undergrad degree at the Evergreen State College in Tacoma. The Dean of Student Services when I was a student there is my boss now, the Dean of Student Services here at Central. So I'm really, uh, I, I love being in the community I came up in. And, you know, this is the, the space where I became an artist. I was big into the punk music scene. I went to the OK Hotel a lot as a kid. I was into zines. And it's not so much there was a point where I decided to become an artist. It's just, you know, you decide not to stop, right? Because everyone makes art as a child. And there's a period where you keep going. And so I kept going. And I was lucky enough to be surrounded by a really vibrant creative community here in Seattle, not just music, but theater and dance and art. And so you know, I knew who exciting, famous artists were like Basquiat and Ocampo. You know, I saw this amazing show at the Henry, but I also knew what it was like to eke out a living as a painter in a, in a city. And, you know, there was a model for me there. And so, you know, I made art and there was a lot of places to show art. In the 90s in particular, Seattle had a vibrant art scene based in Pioneer Square. And I was able to show a lot even though I hadn't really gone to art school and I was just sort of making it up as I went along. Sort of that anarchist spirit hit me young. And so th these are works that are, um, you know, these were taken with a digital camera, a Makita that took a three and a half inch floppy disk. So I apologize about the quality. And they're paintings, they're, you know, sort of sculptural. I, I worked a lot with layered scrap metal and, and um, old, you know, old wood and things like that. But the subject matter was already very much about technology. There were paintings about scientific concepts like genes, abandoned wear, like old mechanical objects, and the idea of the robot and the cyborg. Um, I was doing other paintings about electrical schematics or wormholes and, and different uh, mathematical equations that described deep space or, you know, my superficial understanding of these things. And it was, it was a great time. And then we had a tech boom and the art scene in Pioneer Square got hit pretty hard. And then we had a tech bust and it was just kind of destabilizing. And so 
rather spontaneously, a whole bunch of artists in my cohort, my generation, spontaneously all decided to move to New York. <laughs> and I, it looks like I had a plan. There was no plan. I had some cash and I just showed up in Brooklyn. It was like, let's go. And that is folly, but you know, you're only young once. So I wound up at NYU, which I know is a very lucky thing to have happen. And so instead of being in the becoming artist phase of my life, I was in the becoming cyborg phase. And so this radical notion that I couldn't just make art about technology, but that I could make artwork with technology was like a fire in my soul. And I was like, I'm in. Um, but caveats, and this is kind of, you know, a moment where new media was having, you know, it's time. I was like, I don't want to make video based art. I don't want to make net art. I don't want to make, you know, waving my hand in front of a screen. I want to make physical things. I want to make digital art that has smell and weight and friction and it exists in 3D space. And so physical computing, which is a discipline that involves using like sensors and controls and motors and things like that was a way to do that. And so I studied with Tom Igo, who literally wrote the book on physical computing. And the way that I wanted to make art was to, you know, inhabit 3D space. And I was trying to figure out how to do that because working with technology isn't cheap. And so RFID was this really handy way for me to make a ton of sculptural objects, embed them with these, these trackers. And we all know what RFID is. It's in our library books and clothes. People don't want us to steal from the mall. And um, I was able to connect these objects that I was making to a database through this triggering mechanism. And then the database itself, instead of being text or like MySQL, it was audio. And so there's this relationship between moving objects around these readers and triggering sound. So instead of a keyboard and a screen, which is how we normally interact with computers, it was an object and sound. And so it destabilized your relationship to what a computer was. A computer isn't this object with a screen and a keyboard. That just happens to be the one we use most of the time. So you can see these sort of glowing rubber objects. So imagine picking up just like this soft thing that's an interface for a computer. And I think it's important to note, this is before iPhones. So like touch technology wasn't, you know, as embedded as, it, you know, some of these things are like, yeah, we, that's just how we live now. This is in 2003, goodness, that was a minute ago. And then in the middle here, you see one of the installations I did. This is for the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council. It was an installation called Northern Electronic Research Division or NERD, because we were silly. And, in this space, um, I had embedded readers throughout the architecture. And then there were these hanging objects, all different, like pieces of record, pieces of rubber, these hanging plaster forms that had uh, graphite on the outside. And so as you went to trigger and discover what sounds were connected to different, uh, different objects or different patterns of objects in the order in which they were scanned, you would leave a mark. And so there's this evidence of interaction that builds up. And then on top of that, there's the evidence of, you know, sort of light graffiti. So people are just playing with the space. And so that, that dirtiness, that evidence of human, the, you know, sort of the aging that you'd see in my earlier work was showing up in these interactions. I mean, in these interactive spaces I was making. And then finally I was like, hey, I'm, I'm here to do weird New York art stuff. I'm definitely gonna become a cyborg. And so I injected an RFID chip in my left shoulder. That's a 10 gauge needle. Um, again, remember, I, I came up in the punk scene. So this was like, yeah, you know, <laughs> biohacking makes sense. And there were definitely some professors who were a little concerned and then others who were like, yeah, go, go long. And so I, you know, spent a few years in the space of building out these systems, doing performance work around being a cyborg and like, you know, triggering myself in these sound performances and making objects and got a fair amount of international coverage for that work, but often was like becoming the spokesperson for fascist technology, which is not my intention. And people are like, they're going to track us. And this is this horrible surveillance thing. And it's not really what I'm doing. And also it's not really describing this technology. It's describing the hype around this technology. So you're responding to something that isn't actually what's happening here. And if you would work with this art and come to a peace of mind and, and play with it, you would understand it's not the thing that you think it is, which is like the air trackers that we have today or what have you. And so that was kind of an interesting moment of like making art, but also having to, to untangle a conversation about concerns about technology. And I remember my thesis talking about these surveillance concerns that everyone was pointing at RFID. I'm like, look, 
y'all are on Flickr. You're all on Friendster. That's how long ago it was. And you have a phone in your pocket and you have a credit card. And these are the places where surveillance is happening. And you don't seem to be concerned about that. You're voluntarily uploading pictures of you in the bar last night on Flickr that anyone can see what's the difference between this technology and that technology. And so that was kind of an interesting space, but not necessarily the conversation that I was trying to have. But I, I began to think a lot more about this being a cyborg business. I was all in, but having a chip in your shoulder wasn't really a cybernetic system. Cybernetic systems have to do with feedback and being able to sense and control things with a, with a partnership between a machine and a human. So I'm like, this isn't really it. It's kind of a, a showy piece. I've enjoyed this, but I'd like to move on. And so I came back to Seattle and started working towards building a real cybernetic system for myself. You know, what would it be like to work with exoskeletons and different kinds of sensing and control systems, motor systems, things of that nature. And I was definitely hugely influenced by Rebecca Horn at this point, also Leisha Clark. And so Rebecca Horn's finger pieces, she did quite a number of them where she's, you know, expanding herself into touching space. So those were the entry points for me of thinking about building a, a cyborg body for myself. I got deep into 3D printing and digital fabrication techniques. Like I went, you know, I was going hard working with commercial brain computer interface devices and being able to control text and things. So I had all these components. I was pulling them together and I was able to build things. But a thing was happening at a time, which is as I was getting deeper into tech, deeper into engineering and computer science, places I was teaching, places I was learning, maker spaces. I don't know if this was a coincidence or just a weird year or what happened, but I looked up and in every single space I was in, I was the only woman. And so making work about building a body into technology, building a body in collaboration with technology when you're the only female body and when you're surrounded by men who are making work about a different idea of what a cyborg is, right? A different fiction about a feminized technological body. When you're in a world where people are writing manifestos about how women can't program, this was starting to, to build up in my uneasiness of putting my body out in these spaces. And so in this piece, which is kind of the culmination of the ideas of building a cybernetic body, I'm, I've removed myself so that I'm, there's brain computer interface data, I'm reading a book, the wave patterns are then fed into the system and then it animates the structure underneath it has kind of a bodily component, but I am removed. And then like what I'm doing kind of gets lost. So there's an abstraction here and, and I'm kind of stuck as an artist. Um, and if we can try to play this video. Okay, so I think we get the idea on that piece. I'm gonna go ahead and go back to the slideshow here. So yeah, I mean, the idea that this is a work that has anything to do with becoming a cyborg, I, you know, things are just kind of dissipating. And then I, I basically just pulled the idea of, of working towards, you know, the human feedback system altogether and was just working with feedback. But I just kind of gone into a cul-de-sac of like making things with technology and, the cord sort of dripping away as I was also bumping up against these these problems with gender showing up and inclusivity in in the the, the tech world. You know, 2003 was really different than like the late teens. I don't know what we're calling these decades anymore. And so I kind of stepped away and recalibrated, kind of went to the forest, literally and figuratively, 
And instead of my becoming artist phase or my becoming cyborg phase, I entered my becoming witch phase. And, you know, I came out of the broom closet, which is a goofy term, but to anyone who knew me, it was like, we, we've known this whole time. And I used to talk about the things I did. It's like, this is all art. I'm building altars and storing lots of herbs in jars because I'm an artist. <laughs> and everyone else is like, we have a different word for that. And to be very clear, I use the term witch and I play with it in public, in my writing, in my art. And that holds one space. And then my own practice is, is a discrete thing. I don't even necessarily use the same words and it's not necessarily a super public thing but it's a space where i have a practice i have people who i turn to for guidance and it's mostly about you know observing the mystery and wonder of the universe and the arc of creativity in all of creation right it's i think we're all doing the same thing at the end of the day if we have wonder about being in the universe but in public i'm making dank memes about witch witchcraft <laughs> it's a different vibe right and this whole thing really started with this text called The Familiar Algorithm. And as I was kind of in the space of moving away from what I had done with technology as an artist and working through being in the world as a femme woman, you know, a femme body in space while working with technology, Karen Arnold, they were the, the curator of Bridge Productions in the Hamilton building. So just as Pioneer Square was this locus of art in the 90s, at that point, so this is about 2016, there was a vibrant arts culture in Georgetown centered on the Hamilton building. So this is the Interstitial Gallery, the Alice Gallery and Bridge Productions. And Sharon was like, why don't you write this all down? Why don't you flesh out these ideas? And so I wrote this long essay called The Familiar Algorithm. And it was the speculative history of, you know, a secret, a secret history of technology ushered in by the witches. And so going back to ancient times, you've got sort of the dawn of science in the Mediterranean, you know, traveling out from Central Africa into North Africa and, and the lower parts of Europe, and those traditions being held alive by people who refused to convert into the new way. So these pagans slowly became known as witches. And as they had discovered things like logic and linear thinking in ancient times, this had diminished their ability to do things like astrally project to the moon, right? So you lose magic as you gain reason. And this was really stumping the witches because they couldn't do their witchy things, primarily going to the moon, other, other sort of tasks of, of witchdom. And so they were also encountering trouble with their familiars. So they started building these robotic familiars and they're basically in conflict with the alchemists. So on the other side of the cauldron are, you know, not all witches are women and not all alchemists are men, but by and large alchemists were people who were aligned with power and resources and they were after gold. They were after the philosopher's stone. And by and large, the witches were like, we need healing and we wanna to go to the moon and do witchy stuff on the moon. So they're driven by different motives. And at some point with the witch burnings coming in and, and really you know, disturbing the, the technological advancement of these secret witch cabals of technology, they did a knowledge transfer over to the alchemists. And they said, look, we're, we're building these things. We know we can get to the moon not with our old ways, but with these new electromechanical systems, we're gonna let you in on what we're doing and you take it to the finish line for us. And so the age of enlightenment is really this secret transfer over into the alchemists that are happening at the same time. And they're like, okay, we'll build up all these systems. We got calculus in place during the plague with Newton, blah, 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 boom, Apollo mission. It's worth a read. <laughs> it's hard to describe in a few minutes. But so here's, here's now, Instead of this being being after space of becoming a cyborg, I'm interested in telling this speculative history, which for me is kind of a healing space for dealing with sexism in the world of tech, um, as you do. And so this was one of the first shows where I'm actually trying to build out what does this world feel like and look like? What were some of the steps in between pure magic of the ancient world and the Apollo mission? You know, what were robotic witches, what was their material culture like in the 14th century or something? And so I'm, I'm speculating and building these things out. So this is from a show called Safety. This is one of two shows I've been invited to participate in called Safety, because it's been a rough couple of years uh, politically and, and, you know, disease wise. So these are, I think, very central themes. So I'm, these are protection circuits. And so my friend Ian Curry, who was also in the show, had a mechanical Turk run questions about what do you, you know, what is safety to you? And then I took 
these responses and made protection spells for each of these people. And then this, you know, this ink is, is carbonized rosemary ink. And so that's technically a, a conductive material. So there's not really real electricity happening, but it's giving you the idea of the fact that a circuit is a sigil, is a circle, is a spell. And that every time we use electricity, we're creating a circle from ground, you know, from power to ground. And that's that, you know, sort of first act of witchcraft is to create that sacred circle space. And, you know, in general, I think there's something holy, but like we have made this a holy space by this action. And so in the memes I was working at at the same time, I was fleshing a lot of this idea out as memes. I repeated this idea, a circuit is a sigil, is a circle, is a spell. And this to me tied together this idea that we have this sort of right brain, gestalt, intuitive, magical space, the creative mind. And then we have the linear, rational, and the scientific and the technological. And I was like, nope, I've, I'm just going to see those as the same. I'm going to move forward as if, if they are inhabiting the same space. And then this led to, you know, sort of building it out further. This is the show called Wit and Craftly that was here at the M. Rosetta Hunter Gallery a few years before I worked here. And so I'm starting to build up a little bit more. Um, how do I generate electricity in a way that would make sense to like a 14th or 17th century witch? And so down here we see bog batteries. So I've got wet earth and I've got copper and zinc nails and they're connected to this Instead of a breadboard, it's a bone board. We've got a circuit filled with conductive copper tape, lighting up an LED. And this idea of the bog, just like I was you know, enamored of the idea of this material database I was building with RFID, the idea of the bog as a database, a storage system for ancient bodies, um, for butter, for things that, that the, the chemical compounds in bogs, the sphagnum, um, are the things that dye it black and dissolve the calcium and preserve everything else. So we have thousands and thousands, if not 10,000s of years of information about the way that people lived and often horrific ritual druid sacrifice, not gonna lie, <laughs> it's, it's rough stuff, but there we are. So building circuits with materials that crystallize, you know, witches are very much about crystals. Let's make our own. Let's stop using crystals that are mined by children faraway lands. Let's go to the ocean and gather up that salt and make crystals that resonate from our own labor. And then here we see these shapes, these two circles, and they look a little bit like, you know, the almond shape we see a lot in religious art that is a metaphor for something else. The two circles look a little bit like phases of the moon or moon eclipses, particularly if you look at medieval documents. But these are actually descriptions of log logic gates. These are Venn diagrams that explain these elements. And we know these words, and, or, nor. They're English words. They also map to mathematical concepts and there are symbols for them. They also map to computer circuits. So the Apollo mission all of the, the computer circuits, I think, were one of these gates. I think it was XOR. And so you can build a complex machine by staggering these gates together. And a logic gate just takes two binary inputs and gives you one output. So it might be zero and one, one and one. And depending on the rules of that gate, you get a certain response. It's pretty abstracted, but you put a whole bunch of them together and you can fly to the moon. And so this, again, this intersection of the visual language of witchcraft and the visual language of computer science was like, yeah. And so I've been pretty fixated on these logic gate symbols and then continuing to make memes. Another thing is happening around 2016. I don't know if you remember that summer, earworm of the year. <laughs> I share a name with a pop star and no one will let me forget it. And so uh, I thought this is just going to be a one hit wonder. And it has turned out not to be but I was like, I'm gonna have fun with it because strangely, my digital spaces just got inundated with her fans. But interestingly, they were sort of the same demographic as people who were missing from the pipeline of tech, right? There's this, you know, this problem where particularly around middle school, girls and femme students tend to drop out, right? They're, they're sort of told they're not good at math. They're not good at science. And it's not really based on anything, but it happens. And so it's like, what if we can build a cultural space that that population feels like they have ownership of. You know, I'm going a hot topic. I'm wearing a lot of black eyeliner. I'm getting my first set of tarot cards. You know, I'm witchy, I'm goth, I'm moody. And what if I could pair that with computer science? And again, this is maybe not a very utilitarian idea, 
but here's what I was doing. So I started tagging everything with this tag, Megan Trainer, which means, and these people would find me and be like, what is this? And I'm like, well, <laughs> let's talk about your interest in computer science. And I think it's invisible to the rest of the world, but to this day, I get texts and emails and all sorts of interactions with people asking for tickets or, you know, my grandchild is sick. Can she come see you in concert? And I'm like, look, I've, I've got a performance down the street, but I don't think that's what you mean. Um, but through these memes, like with the familiar algorithm, I'm trying to build out just this idea of, of a space, uh, this utopian speculative space. And questions like, is electricity sacred, you know, seeks to interrupt the idea that electricity comes from Ben Franklin, but rather it's the oldest substance in the known universe if you subscribe to the Grand Unified Theory, which I do, right? So at the beginning, we've got a flash of light, strong force, weak force, gravity, electromagnetism and then something else and that kind of maps to the five-pointed star of witchcraft which is you know wood fire water earth and ether and sort of something else and so you start to see this you know maybe they knew what they were talking about kind of thing i'm not going to go in detail to all these but there's hundreds of these and if you hop on this hashtag you can find them what's funny too is like her fans especially if they don't speak english as a native language will tag her stuff with this tag so if you go to this hashtag, you'll see like concert footage and fan art and all kinds of wonderful things. And so that chaotic space, I love it. But I realized that like making memes wasn't gonna help, you know, middle school girls get into to computer science. So it's like, why don't I actually just do it? Why don't I take, you know, the fact that my name, you know, I own megantrainer.com. People find me and are looking for her, but I'm like, wait, wait, you're a 12 year old girl. You're starting to lose interest in math and science. But what if I could teach you Python in a way that, you know, focused on tarot cards or spells? You know, like, let's do it. And so I'm hoping to be done by the end of the summer. I've got a Patreon if you want to support that project. And it's just going to be like a fun intro class. I taught AI and machine learning in Python a couple of summers ago, and that was okay. Um, but I'm really more interested in building something that rather than is teaching people to be useful members of of late capitalism is is empowering people to be knowledgeable about computer science without buying into I, I don't know I don't want to go down too far about but I think there's a point where we we can be something besides consumers and pushing innovation that that is along capitalist lines and we can be using computer science in a way that's more about our self-expression or just being knowledgeable about the world around us we can't avoid it and so in this class, I'm, I'm, you know, looking at like, let's review basic Python, let's build some tarot decks. And then um, down here, you know, this is very, very rough. I'm still working on it, but using um, an API in Dolly 2 to dynamically generate tarot cards on the fly based on the system that you're building. So going back to that cybernetic system of pulling data in and building up a database so that you're customizing it's almost like, like a cybernetic tarot deck that represents you, your aesthetics, what previous readings you've had, your ideas about what divination looks like for you. Um, and I feel like this is a, a pretty satisfactory end to this like meme project that was just a joke about a one hit wonder and dealing with the lifelong problem <laughs> of my name, which is why I use my full name now. Let's get back to the art. So again, I'm starting to build up more and more this world of what is it to use electricity as a medieval witch? What would that look and feel like? Um, what is it like to build, you know, instead of using votive candles, we're lighting little lights. With, you know, we didn't have LEDs in the 14th century, but bear with me. Um, so using bog material, using salt water, talking about, um, I'm using this, this crown here, this, this piece is called uh, Electron Oracle. And Electron is the name for Amber. And amber was the first sort of detection of electrical properties. So the ancient Greeks were like, look, if you rub smooth amber, you get this thing happen. And that's where the word electricity comes from. So this idea of these, again, this very right brain um, prophetic diviners of the ancient world slowly drifting into a more rational space that's making room for the use of electricity in divination and in living in, in that same space of you know wanting to travel to space and commune with the moon and be in touch with the seasons and beyond the seasons the entire universe. I then had a show um, curated by Nagara Ekudumu at COCA 
Um, and here I was trying to really dive into explaining what a logic gate is. Um, there's eight computer chips that are logic gates. They have a truth table. You can activate them through switches and then they have these Venn diagram patterns. And the name of the show was Let Us Not Confuse Zero with the Stillness of Electrons. And so when we think about computers, we've all kind of got that, like the zeros and ones from the matrix and green screen coming down. And that's not really what's happening with the computer. That's like a, a, a human map. And what zeros and ones are actually in a computer is the stillness or movement of electrons. So you've got zero to five volts in an electronic circuit. And it's not even zero or, or five, it's sort of 0.15, you know, a zero to 0.2 maybe. And above like 3.5 to five, that'll be read as the one. And so these pulsing, you know, aspects of electricity, are the electrons moving? Or are they not moving? And it's not just electricity, it's not electrons just moving through a copper wire, but it's also the, the magnetic wave that's going around the wire that is electricity. So there's two things happening. So thinking about electricity and this just fundamental, like to me, what is the beautiful and poetic way of these waves and electrons moving or not moving, and that powers everything. That's how information is stored. That's how we talk to each other. That's how we make cinema now. That's how we take photographs. And it's not a bunch of green zeros and ones on a computer screen. It is something that is made up of these elements that were there at the beginning of the universe. It belongs to everyone, right? This isn't an invention, it just is. And so from that show, I'm trying to you know, drill down into what does each of these logic gates mean, both mathematically and in a computer science context and poetically. A buffer is to regenerate, a not gate is an inverter. And in talking to Nagara, you know, she doesn't come from a computer science background and I'm down in the weeds. And so we're talking through what are these things and how to understand them. And she comes from the Palo Monte tradition. Um, so she's a spiritual practitioner of, of many traditions. And we arrived at this place where there's something in, and I can't describe accurately her spiritual system, but there's something about the way that you deal with letting energy flow or blocking energy and craft. And so that, that movement or that blockage maps to some of these gates. And suddenly we had a way to talk about this computer science concept in a language that was familiar to her. And again, that, that overlay of spiritual systems and technological systems, you know, that it's a one-to-one. -one. It's just finding the vocabulary to see those. And so uh, she wrote this wonderful essay. I'm just gonna read a little quote from it. Uh, fast forward nearly a millennia, Trainer occupies a similarly liminal space into which she enters, partners with, and then translates the core components of computer science, distilling them down into their fundamental core parts, electricity, logical intention, and mathematics. In these instances, zero becomes a place of potentiality, a space that becomes, produces, and holds boundless possibilities for the desired set of outcomes. And so to have someone just nail it, to, to come from, you know, I don't know what you're doing necessarily to we're sitting in the space together looking at where you know the technological and the spiritual overlap and the poetics of all of this exist um and then i'm just going to show a little bit of the last few shows um, and then close up so this is the safety show uh, that was in beacon hill and there seems to be a system here there seems to be function and and meaning and it's not explicit and so I encourage people to look at it and go, it seems like a world. <laughs> and yes, and uh, there's, there's no right answer to what you're looking at. I'm building a box battery that's looking at using crystal oscillators because crystals are in all our technology and which is dig crystals. Um, I'm building circuits with honey. I built a Faraday mask that looks like something, you know, very old. I'm working with amber, I'm working with salt water, I'm building a wand out of vinegar and pennies. You know, all of these things are just a visual vocabulary of a space that I dreamt up and I want to build. And you'll notice in the middle, there's a, there's a few glass jars creating one of these lights. And this one was in Seattle in September. And then this, this one in the dark background with the dark background is called Cold, Cold War Sigil Number One. That one was in Berlin. So simultaneously, I had Cold War Sigil number one and two. And this was a response to the, the Russian and Ukraine war. And everyone was buying these radiation tablets, which are just iodine. 
So I'm like, I, I got some of these pills and I drop them in salt water. And this is a spell of protection against nuclear annihilation. And it's an irrational way to, start, to respond to nuclear annihilation as a you know, checklist on your day of things to worry about. But the irrational thing is nuclear war. You can only deal with it in an irrational way. The amygdala just needs something to be happening because we don't have the power to, to stop that, but we need to do something with that energy. It needs to be inverted in our minds and our deep core consciousness. And then this mask that you saw here on the wall, this is to weave electricity. And remember how I talked about witches wanna to get to the moon and eventually they did it with the Apollo mission. And I'm not really kidding. <laughs> so um, the computer systems on the Apollo mission, there's a couple, there's core rope memory and core memory or wired core memory. And so you see this lattice of copper wire and then you see these little metal beads, they're toroids made of iron and they can turn clockwise or counterclockwise based on the electrical signal, which direction it's coming through. And that counterclockwise or clockwise is zero and one. And so these beads are strung together and signals are coming through. And that's how the computer code, which was written by Margaret Hamilton, Margaret Hamilton, the computer programmer, not the actress who played the witch in The Wizard of Oz, bit of confusion there. And so these, these stacks and stacks and stacks were minuscule. And the only people who could really manage to manufacture them were women. And statistically, some of these women were witches. So the conspiracy has come full circle. So we know that they put everything in there needed for the space mission. We don't know what else those witches might've put into the memory that went into the Apollo mission that went in an electromechanical device to the moon, but it looks something like this. And for this show, I continued to work on memes. And so I've been working with Dolly too, and working with you know, sort of regenerating text in Python. And I love working with, you know, Dolly 2 is so glitchy. I think I'm gonna stay there. I don't want something super realistic. It's just a better way to form collages. And then finally, this is a space time machine from Sphagnon, which is coming up on June 23rd at Frontier Home. And I'm just continuing to build electromechanical systems that allow me to travel to the deep, you know, deep parts of the universe um, with seaweed and moss and bogs and pieces of copper. That's it. Thanks. Thank you so much. Wow. Yay. Um, I didn't say it at the beginning. Um, if you have questions, put them in the chat. Um, we have a lot of comments in the chat. Um, a lot of people want to take that class and we're okay being surrounded by 12 year old girls, but <laughs> might need our own class as well. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the, the classes are on demand. And I think, you know, I think the starting point is the lost fans of Megan Trainer. But I think at the end of the day, just teaching computer science in a way that is more inclusive. And so I'm choosing, you know, witchy tarot, but I think it's for anything. Like, what are you interested in? Because not everyone wants to, uh, you know, learn how to play the stock market or whatever we're learning, you know. And, and so that inclusion starts, I mean, I work in a college, like inclusion starts with representation and, and references that, you know, are inviting and not blocking. Yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you. I am just going to read some things from the chat, unless people would like to uh, ask questions live, that's also fully viable. Can people unmute themselves? Yes. Oh. I know. I was I I was uh, hoping for a, a good audience. So um, Astrid Larson says, re pushing to the side. I just met a woman who is an electrotherapist. She is using techniques from the early 1900s that Tesla created as one of his inventions. She has two original antique electrotherapy kits. The glass tubes are filled with neon and argon. Some of the tubes are curved to create circuits. This kind of healing treatment was mainstream until the 1940s when big medical pushed homeopathy and other alternative treatments to the side as not medicine. So yeah. it's common underground like other folk or women's magic. Yeah, there's a lot of, um, I mean, it's just centuries of if, if the medicine's coming from, you know, women folk or folks who have to deal with the reproductive system, 
there's a lot of like, oh no, we've got this. And, you know, infant, morta you know, mortality goes up in the, in the birthing room and things like that. Um, one of the things I discovered was that ancient Egyptians were doing almost the same thing with electric eels. They're just like, oh yeah, this is, this is great for skin. It's great for pain. And, you know, I, I, yeah, I, I, I'm so excited for all the ways that electricity exists that we maybe don't think about because we, again, we're sort of, it exists in this space, you know, and um, I love all the different spaces it emerges from. It's, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. I'm gonna look into that. Hannah Chang uh, says, can you speak a little bit more about how language and translation factor into your work? Do you see yourself as translating between the languages of computers, bog witches and bog computer witches, or as working on something involving, but not wholly encompassed by language? I think, um, I, I'm not sure how exactly to answer that. I mean, I would say that one of the things I'm, I'm teasing out from my own journey, from not knowing anything about technology to being someone who works with computer language is what are those barriers? And how do we build you know, more and more bridges between the intuitive forms of learning we have? Like it's much easier for humans to learn language than to write. Right, writing isn't quite as natural and computer science kind of sits in that same space. So what are the bridges to, you already know what's happening here. You just need a little recalibration. And I know for myself, I'm a very visual learner. I kind of have to make up stories to understand anything. And so a lot of my work is mirroring what's worked for me. So it might not work for everyone, but I think if you, if you understand the underlying poetics of electricity or the underlying poetics of logic, or just how computer science maps to English we might understand or other languages, it can help you feel like, oh, this is something for me. Instead of, I think people can feel pushed out, like this is too much, or I can't express myself here. This is just for, um, you know, big business or e-commerce or, you know, what is it you want to do with computer language? You might not know yet because you feel that. And so I want something that pulls you in. Love that. Yeah, um, and also just uh, knowing you for just a small amount of time, I know that the lang language is important to you also, like as like a talker, as somebody who expresses themselves. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it, it shows up in the memes and the writing yeah. and, and I do a lot of spoken word stuff. So yeah, <laughs> like, <which is> totally. <laughs> Great, are there other questions? I'm sort of, yeah, I'm sort of in that space of, yeah, like, wow, I know very little about the world, so. <laughs> but again, like I said in that last, you know, that last image, like, it's not something to get. It is just, it's just like a, a, a barrage of, you know, like every single thing in my brain wants to draw these connections, and even if they aren't there, I'm going to build them, and I think that if you're trying to make it make sense, it, 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 it won't. But if you just allow it to be this mm -hmm. visual system of um, everything that has ever interested me being, you know, it's like the, the crazy person with the red string and in the room with all the pictures, like that's my brain. <laughs> well, and I think it, that's a beautiful place um, for art. I mean, right, mm -hmm. like that's what is the art making of that um, is, is your experiences and you being, uh, who you are and bringing all of those things into that ball, you know, is beautiful. Tatiana. Yeah, I wanted to ask, you mentioned Patreon, um, and I, I was hoping you'd maybe type in a link on the chat because there were so many of us who really responded to the idea of this class, and you meant, and I think that you, you said that they were linked somehow through Patreon, so I'd love to just have that available yeah. to you. Sure, one second. So here's my old website, it's kind of under construction and that has a link to, there we go. Here's the direct link. So I'm sort of like in the middle of, I just built the new artist website with meganelizabethtrainer.com. I need to now change the old megantrainer.com. It's sort of half website for the mm -hmm. school and half old art site. So um, once I get through this month of, oh, I should go to the last slide, uh, this month of so many things happening, I'll have time to, to fix that all up, but June, June got busy. Let's take a look. Yes. All um, right. 
yeah, so here's, here's everything I've got going on in the next 30 days. I'm part of the Art and Flight show at the Museum of Flight. Obviously, the big thing is the Sagnan show at Frontier Home. I'm in the Bemis show starting July 8th. Uh, we're having a closing talk. So if you want more talking from me and Sarah, uh, that's July 23rd. And then, oh, I didn't talk about this. Next July, I'm super excited. I am going to Denmark uh, to do a residency at Captive Portal. I'm going to have a show at the end of that residency. And I don't know if you know this, but Denmark is full of bogs. And so um, there's going to be sort of leading this next year, I'm going to be working with the curator there and, and sort of doing interventions that are safe for the bog, but like possibly like burying cloth that I'll then work with when I arrive. And so getting that like, you know, I, I'm not sure yet, but that's, that's what's happening. So communing wow. with the bog is a really exciting next step in my work. All right. Oh, it's so great to hear from you and, and to go in this direction that is so full of potential. So, thank you. Yeah, and it's, it's a lot. Even I'm like, wait, where, where am I going? And it, um, you know, I, I just, I think that, like I said, there was a place where I was kind of like lost in this eddy of what am I actually doing with all this? And now feeling like it all is very much making sense. There's this, I mean, maybe not to anyone else, but you know, this, this fertile space of like building out these ideas and having them, you know, be in this range from like, okay, there's a practical thing where I want to, you know, bring my vision of how to learn computer science to people and then making goofy memes and then also making artworks and then also making, you know, functional, you know, electromechanical objects that harken to this, you know, invented reality. And so all of those things playing together feels really good. And it's a nice place to be as an artist. I mean, I think we all go through, you know, there's that space of what am I doing or the work's not resonating or you're just having the wrong conversation. So like when I was having the conversation with RFID where people are like, this is, you know, you're, you're a spokesperson for fascism. I'm like, I don't, I don't think that's what I'm doing, but let me revisit. <laughs> Let me revisit what's going on and feeling like the, you know, everything's in alignment. It's nice. But um, yeah, it's just, it's been really lovely to be here and, and talk this out. And like I said, before we went live, like I haven't really done an overview of my artwork in a long time. I've given talks, but not, this is my work. Um, so it was, it was nice for me too, to kind of see where I've arrived at. Um, Cause it's hard to see down the weeds. So yeah, it's been great. Thank right. you. Yay, thank you so much. I'm going to stop uh, the recording, but we can uh, be here for a couple minutes also. Thank you, thank you.